Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you like it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel, and that way you'll never miss a thing. Well, if you're like me, you're always looking for ways to stay informed and engaged with the world around us. And that's why I created On The Rise. It's a curated weekly newsletter packed with thought-provoking articles and insights on faith, culture, and the future of the church and really any other subject that I find fascinating and conversation worthy. And I send it to you absolutely free every single week. So if you're ready to join the conversation and be part of a community of curious, engaged leaders, you can subscribe to On The Rise today at ontherisenewsletter.com. You can start and stop at any point on theRiseNewsletter.com. This episode is also presented by Glue. Glue is connecting the faith ecosystem in innovative ways. One way is by making it a lot easier for churches to connect with new visitors. Did you know, for example, that the time it takes for a church to respond to new visitors has a major impact on whether that new person or family will stay? Well, with Glue, you can use automation to build engaging new visitor engagement journeys. You can learn how at get.glue.us slash visitors. That's get.glue.us slash visitors. And now to today's episode. Paula, welcome back to the podcast. It's so good to see your face again, friend. I mean, not that I don't see you often, but in this setting, it's nice to see you again. It is really good to see you too. We always have so much to catch up on when we see each other on mic or off mic. And uh, I want to start with you as an interviewer. We were chatting about that right before we started (laughs) recording. It's something I really enjoy doing. And you've interviewed, I mean, I just pulled this from the internet, but Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Nicole Kidman, Tom Hanks, Steph Curry, uh, the cast of Avengers and Star Wars. Any other notables on there like that you can think (laughs) of that it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, in that Avengers interview, that was that was Scarlett Johansson, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans, Robert Downey Jr., Jeremy Renner, and oh my gosh, what? who's the Hulk? I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. I don't. You think I watch <laughs> that so stuff? Bad. I have no clue. Oh, I'm like pop culture ignorant. No, it was. I don't know it, who is the Hulk. Um, I have no idea. I am told. Oh. Is it Mark Ruffalo? I think it's Mark Ruffalo. Why was I totally blanking on that? No, I've had the opportunity to interview like, you know, big, big names, politicians, um, A-listers, Renee or, you know, Reese Witherspoon, uh, Tiger, Tiger Woods. But I really just enjoy interviewing the everyday person too and Mm -hmm. hear what makes them tick. Um, When people ask me this question though, and they do routinely, what's your favorite interview? Um, people laugh and I, I'm often, I'm often hesitant to even admit it because, um, before I took a job at at the network level, you know, I worked in smaller markets to work my way up the ladder. I was working in Dayton, Ohio and Cincinnati, Ohio, and then Chicago and then New York. That's where I went to the network, but I was working in Cincinnati, Ohio at WCPO. And I had a chance to interview Bo Schembechler. Now, Bo Schembechler um, I, you know, I grew up in Michigan. He was, he is a legend. He was a legendary okay. football coach at the there university of Michigan. And I had a chance to interview him because he had also coached at Miami university of Ohio. And I had to go back there for an assignment. And right. that was one of my favorite interviews, but usually people are like, who, who's that? But for well, me, that was going to be my reaction. Yeah, yeah. I know. What made it, what made it good? Because Michigan football has it is like baked into my DNA. I grew up just around, you know, not far from the stadium. My dad and I, it wasn't just a sport or a game. It was like, it was like so much uh, a part of our relationship. We would yeah. go to games on Saturdays. If we didn't, we would tailgate. We would watch the games. I just fell in love with Michigan football. My dad was an alum. My whole family pretty much went to Michigan. So they had season tickets and um, just loved Michigan football. And if you love Michigan football, Bo. Like he, he, he's, it's just Bo. It's not Bo Schembechler. Mm. It's just Bo. He is it. He is the king and he passed away years ago. But, uh. um, and so anyway, it was, it was just a really cool moment. Cause I grew up idolizing him and idolizing Michigan football. And he is symbolic of everything that kind of represents Michigan football. And again, for me, it's not, it's, it wasn't just a sport. It's not just a sport or a game. It was something that I shared 
very deeply. It was a deep connection between my father and I before he passed a couple of years ago. So Beauchamp wow. back there, but yeah, all the other names too are great. Yeah. But, yeah. You know. What do you do? Like, do you ever get intimidated when you're interviewing, <laughs> say the president or um, uh, an A-list actor? You know, what's so funny is I don't because, and I, I don't know if this is embarrassing to admit or not, but I'm like, they have to sit on the toilet every day too. So yeah, I'm like, yeah, that, yeah, and it's yeah. just like, and for me that always humanized them. Like they're people too. Like they uh-huh. have, they have, you know, they might not have the same type of lives, right. As us. And it might look a lot different, but at the end of the day, everybody has to sit on the toilet and that really like humanizes everybody. I know that's really weird to think, but that mm-hmm. kind of got me out of my own head when I started to put people on a pedestal. I will say I've never been starstruck except for once. And that was um, Chris Hemsworth, who oh, yeah. is from the Avengers. And I, totally lost my train of thought when I was interviewing him. So that like, was what, what are you thinking then? I'm talking to Chris Hemsworth. Well, I hadn't met him in person before and I've interviewed him a couple of times when I was anchoring GMA and then separately um, for the, when I was interviewing the whole cast of Avengers. But this particular day I was filling in um, anchoring Good Morning America and he was one of the hosts or he was one of the guests there uh, that we were having in for the day. He was going to be promoting one of his upcoming films and never met him. He comes out, sits down, and, you know, we have, as anchors, we have all of our cards. Like, they've discussed the questions that we're going to ask mm-hmm. ahead of time. You know, when you have a... There's so, no when you, when you have an A-list, like, typically, their their publicists are like, they got that on lockdown. You, know, you have to stay in this lane. I want you to ask these questions. They've been approved by his team. Um, anyway, I, I look at my card and getting ready to ask my question. And then I look over to the left and I look, he looks at me and I look into his eyes and I was... As much as much as I'll be honest, I had no idea that I was just going to lock eyes with him. And he probably didn't even think twice, but I lost my train of thought. I had to look back at the card and, oh my gosh, what was my question again? Because I totally just blanked. Um, he was, but I think what made him, and I don't, like, I, I tell my husband this all the time. I think Chris Hemsworth is just adorable, but like mm. there's something attractive about him because he's such a family man. He is so deeply right. devoted to his wife and his children, which makes him more attractive too. But that's only happened once where I totally lost my train of thought and it was with Chris uh. Hemsworth and embarrassing. But when you're working is. within a script, which is interesting, right? Uh-huh. Because this is sort of freewheeling. I send you the questions in advance. It goes in a million different directions and I give every guest mm-hmm. the right to edit. If you end up saying something that you're like, oh, that didn't come out right, we'll cut it out. And right. that happens 1% of the time, 2% right. of the time, very, right. very rarely. But like when you're sitting down with Scarlett Johansson, mm-hmm. how do you how do you get the edge? Because she's doing the tour. She's doing Good Morning America. She's doing the Today Show. She's, she's been doing asked every- these questions a million times. Yes. She could do it on autopilot and give you the exact same clip she gave mm-hmm. everybody else. And there's almost a point at which... You know, because they're all doing print interviews, they're doing Vanity Fair, they're doing Glamour, they're doing all that stuff. And then they've got you. How do you mm-hmm. make it a moment? Uh, that's a, such a great question. And I think regardless of who you're interviewing, you always want them to feel seen and heard mm-hmm. and that you've done your mm-hmm. homework. So if I can pull up a little nugget that maybe... Um, hasn't been covered in the press much. So it might not have something t- completely to do with, the, you know, maybe she's promoting the Avengers. Maybe it doesn't have something to do with that, but something else. And if you can let them know that you have, that you care enough, that you have done your homework on this person, that you've done your homework um, on the project, that you've either read the book, that you've seen the movie, you've dug into who they are, what makes them tick, and you know a little bit about them, and you can ask a question uh, that might be from, you know, that maybe got coverage 20 years ago. Um, something like that can give you the edge too. But I think in a group setting like that, Get, getting them to interact with one another, having them mm. ask one another questions too. I mean, I've had to do the largest sit down interview that I ever did was with the cast of Modern Family when they were getting oh. ready to shoot their final season. And I think there are 20 something people and that was like herding cats, right? So with something like that, you're like, you know, that that was a challenge in and of itself. But I think the most important thing 
when you're interviewing somebody, when you're talking with somebody, there are all kinds of techniques you might have heard about mirroring, which is repeating the last three words that they said. Or am I hearing you right when you say this, you know, getting Mm -hmm. them to open up a little bit more. But if you can find that nugget or if you have just proven to them that you care enough about this interview that you've taken time out of your day to really look into it and who they are. And you've read the book, you've watched the movie, you know all about the project that goes a long way and you get them to open up. And once Mm -hmm. you get them to open up, then you can try those techniques, the mirroring. So which mirroring is you, you, let's say they, they, uh, it's just repeating essentially the last couple of Mm -hmm. words that they said. So if they end it with, yeah, and that was just a really hard time. And then you would say, a really hard time, you know, and like, so Mm -hmm, you could just, mm -hmm. you could go a little bit deeper, the eye contact, looking at them, acting like you're engaged, just gets them to open up. And that's what I think, and I'm not tooting my own horn, but I would routinely have people tell me after the interview, that was a fantastic interview. Um, you, you just seemed like you really cared and you got me to open up and say things that I never have said have admitted before. Mm. And if you just are engaged and, and truly care, and I, I mean, I'm just inherently nosy. So it's not hard for me to come out of my shell and act like I care. Cause I do, I'm just, I love to ask questions. My nickname was Paula 20 questions. So, right, um, right. but just, just care and make them feel seen and heard. Mm. Gives you the edge. Yeah. There is that emotional connection with people. What do you do? Because some people, not not a lot, but some people are going to be in interview sessions or even in conversation. I think this is a good conversational tool where maybe you suspect someone is on script. Maybe you suspect that, okay, I'm not, I've done my homework, I've prepped, but this person's just doing the talking points that the PR people gave her or gave mm-hmm. him. Do you have any techniques or devices? And this happens in conversations too, where you're having lunch with somebody and you kind of feel, I think they're kind of checked out. Like it does happen. Do you have any techniques to get them back on track? Yeah. I I mean, a lot, a lot of times I'll lean in a little bit, right? Oh, good Um, idea. Yeah, yeah, I'll lean in because it amazes me how many executives or high level um, personalities I've interviewed that just aren't able to get their point across effectively um, because maybe they don't have good body language or they look down or they ramble and ramble. And so it is good for them to have their talking points, but to get them out of their shell, a lot of times I'll just, I'll just lean in a little bit and I'll do that mirroring or I'll have them repeat something or like, so if I'm hearing you correctly, is this right? That really happened to you? It doesn't, you know, and so I, I, what I really try to do Um, You know, when I first started interviewing people, I was a little more nervous, I would say. Um, And I would have like pages of questions written down. And towards the end um, of my career and (laughs) at ABC, at least, I would just have a couple of topics and I wouldn't write out the full question. And what that forced me to do is really engage with them and listen. I think Mm -hmm. listening in an interview or a conversation when just an everyday conversation is a lost art. And you can try mirroring or you can say, and I've learned this from other leaders that have implemented this. So this isn't like me just, <laughs> this isn't my tip. I've, I've It's so good. I've learned it and implemented it from someone else. Just saying, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you lean in a little bit. So if I'm hearing corre- you correctly, is this is this how you're feeling or is this is this what you want to do with the situation? You know, and then you get them to open up and they feel comfortable. Mm, it's funny. You know, you just did that. For those of you watching on YouTube right now, Paula uh-huh. just leaned in on that last answer. I did a answer, little bit. Yeah. And it really drew me in. I hadn't Thank thought about you. that. I usually stand for interviews like I'm standing right now. Yes. And the reason is I find it focuses my attention better than when I'm sitting. Interesting. But you can't really like, I guess I can lean forward a little yes, bit. But yeah. uh, no, that's that's... Those are really good thoughts. Um, I also say something weird, and this might be mm-hmm. like when you're doing uh, maybe like, let's say you're an executive or you're a leader and you're on the other side. So you're the one being asked the questions. Mm-hmm. I also say warm eyes, have warm eyes. Oh, what like, does that mean? It, that just means like, like you can have be very stoic and you're and no, no, you aren't emoting anything. Or can you tell a difference if I'm just like warm eyes, like and yeah. conversational eyes, like it's, it's mm. inviting someone in to have a conversation saying, I'm vulnerable. Will you be vulnerable to let's have a conversation. So I know it sounds weird, warm. I'm not saying warm, sexy eyes. Okay. I'm just <laughs> saying warm conversational eyes, right? 
So. Do you have any thoughts on, on silence? You worked in TV. I worked in TV briefly, did a lot of time in radio and the number one enemy was dead air, dead air, mm-hmm. dead air. You don't want any <laughs> dead air. Right. But I find particularly as I've done this, that silence and pausing and just living through that awkward two seconds Mm -hmm. can be really good at exposing other layers. Do you have any thoughts on silence and its role in conversation and interviews? Well, I think it, it depends. If you're doing a live interview, silence can feel deafening. Okay. Um, I, and, and just for me in my everyday life, silence also, it can be a little awkward. I tend to, and that's when I get diarrhea of the mouth and I just start talking and rambling. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just talking to fill the air and to fill time. But I think there's a difference. Like if you're truly engaged and you have tapped into that art of listening and leaning in and showing you care, that silence on the other side it might be a really impactful moment. So don't be so quick to jump in and try to break up that silence because they may be dealing with something that they've never talked about and they don't know how to articulate it. And so give them a little bit of time, lean in, listen. And then if they say something along the lines of, I don't really know how to explain it. You know, it's just, it's, it's just a really hard time. Then you try the mirror and you just say, it was a really hard time. Mm-hmm. You tell, you know, and just like, mm-hmm. you just, you, you try some of those techniques, the warm eyes, the conversation, the lean in, the listening. If you're listening, you know when that pause is needed and you know when that pause is like, help me, save me. I need you to start talking about something else. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but listening will help you engage and differentiate. I don't really think about that lean in technique. Mm-hmm. I think it could be a good management technique too. It just mm-hmm. it 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 um conveys caring. In it does. Way. It shows you're listening and you're and you do care. And a lot of people just that's really all they want. They want to feel seen and heard. They want to know that you care, right? And no, you <laughs> might not come to um an understanding. You may end up on different sides of the decision or or um you may end up on just different sides of the issue or whatever it is you're talking about. But like I think it goes a long way when people know that you care. Have you ever had an interview go real sideways? You don't have to name names, but have you ever had one where it's just like mm. I don't know, beating your mm-hmm. head against a wall for yes. answers? Or mm-hmm. yeah. I have. Where it was again um, in this particular one was a taped interview and this person um, was just not looking at me. The answers wasn't really answering the question. So I had to kind of loop back. I had to really do a lot of that leaning in and like ask the, the mirroring. Um, one of the interviews that I did when I was at still at GMA, um, it kind of went, it went sideways before the interview and this person, I don't know if they had a double personality or what, but before the interview started, you know, sometimes she'll talk to their PR team and they'll say, Hey, I don't, what are you, what are you going to ask them? And I, you know, as a journalist, just for integrity reasons, you don't always reveal unless it's a live interview, you know, um, for the most part, you're like, here's what we're going to be talking about. And this publicist was so protective of this particular talent. And this talent was like berating me. And um, what was so shocking was that the moment the lights flipped on for the interview, this particular talent was a different person, amenable, affable, kind, magnanimous. And I was like, what? What just happened? Total personality switch. Total personality switch. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And you're you're going to get those every now and then, but for the most part I've had pretty good experiences. Yeah. Again, cuz you show you care. If you show you care, people just they open up around you. They really do. Uh we can cut this out if it's not the answer I'm expecting, but I just need to know <laughs> is Tom Hanks actually the nicest man in Hollywood? Literally that one and people ask me when they say what is your favorite interview, I'll say if I don't say Bo Schembechler, and again, go back to earlier in this conversation, right, if right, you guys right. are listening, you're like, who? Um, I say Tom Hanks because I, I distinctly remember um, it was at uh, Disney World and the new Toy Story theme park. They were just, they were adding some new rides and the new movie was coming out. And so it was Tom Hanks um, and it was Tim Allen. 
sitting Mm. next to one another. And Disney had arranged for the interview and it was right on the ground. So you could see one of the rides at Disney World right behind it. Um, And I was there for Good Morning America to do this exclusive interview. Good Morning America, by the way, is owned by Disney. So we always got first rights to, to the actors who starred in these movies. Well, anyway, it happened to be a pretty like nasty day that day. And they decided to do the interview outside. Disney has taken care of all the logistics, setting up for the interview. Well, overhead, um, what was giving us shelter from, and it was just like a, a light mist at first. And then it became pretty much a downpour during during the interview to the point where water was just kind of like pouring onto Tom. And I, and I said, we could stop doing this interview. And he's he was so gracious. He went into his character from, um, oh my gosh, Wilson, what's the movie? Not Lost. Uh, oh yeah, uh, from, um, what is yeah, the I know what you're talking about. The one where he's on the island. Yeah, people and, are screaming at us right now saying- uh-huh. They're like, guys, come on. Hold on, uh, I actually yeah. need to look this up. Okay, uh, we're gonna Google mo- this. Movie, uh, Tom- Hanks. Hanks Wilson movie uh-huh. Castaway. Thank you. Castaway. Okay. So there anyway, wow, he, my pop culture is <laughs> 0 for twenty today. Same. I am. Uh-huh. I would be so bad on Jeopardy because I'm like it's it's right there, but I can't yeah. articulate it. It's like um. he's on an island, uh, grows a beard, <laughs> comes out of a cave at the end. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, all he wanted was a lighter, was fascinated by the lighter when he got back. Okay, so anyway, so this interview, it, like it's really starts to, to downpour and it's clear that they hadn't set up the proper, like they hadn't made the proper arrangements to keep us right. dry. And um, he was, his shirt was progressively getting wetter and wetter. <laughs> and he went into his character from Castaway and was was cupping the water in his hands. Like he did, all he wanted was some something to drink. And he was the greatest sport ever, both he and Tim Allen. But after that interview, I just had, I, I mean, I always had admiration for Tom Hanks. I think he's a brilliant actor and yeah. he seems to be a good human. I had such a great experience because he, here he is an A-lister and he can say, screw this interview. Like, oh, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this anymore, you guys. He totally went along with it and not only went along with it, like played into it. So I have a great amount of respect for Sir Thomas Hanks because of that Well, I'm glad I asked that question because there are a lot of people who have a platform, not like Mm -hmm. Tom Hanks, but a lot of communicators, pastors, leaders Mm -hmm. who are, quote, public figures and get put in situations like that. And there's a pretty clear line. There's very down-to-earth, humble people. And then there are the prima donnas who are like, oh, we didn't sign up for this and cancel Mm -hmm. the interview. And where's my umbrella? And where's my room temperature water and all that stuff, right? Do you have a theory? I'm just curious because you've interviewed so many people Mm -hmm. on why some people in the public spotlight stay grounded and why other people become divas. Um, Well, clearly, if you're seeing those leaders that are acting like that, they didn't they haven't studied servant leadership. I do think it really determine it's determined by who you surround yourself with. If Ah. you have if you have and that starts with you, if you've surrounded yourself with enablers who will say Hmm. anything that you want them to say to keep you in your inner circle and that's what you reward then that's what you're going to get and guess what you're going to step in some hot lava and you're going to get burned because you don't have anyone that can get in your face and save you from yourself but if you have set yourself up and you've set a tone of empowerment where you want people to challenge you and hold you accountable from the beginning and i learned this at a leadership conference you have monthly meetings and you say, tell me something I don't want to hear about myself as a leader. Mm, you know, if, you, if you create that environment of transparency and again, you're, you're in charge here, but again, it's like servant leadership. It's empowerment. I want, I tell my team all the time, look, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to take risks, but I also need you to save me from myself. You guys know wow. me, you know, my tendencies, So just give me a heads up. If you think I'm going, because I said the last one thing that drives me crazy is when people say, oh, I knew that that wasn't going to work. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me? Right. So Mm. I try to create a space where people so that we never get to that point. Right. So we never so there's no finger pointing where we're we're all trying to, you know, iron, we're sharpening one another. And no, it's not always what you want to hear, but you say it in love and you've created that space of humility and trans transparency and leadership, servant leadership. And again, tell me something I don't want to hear about myself. Mm. That's real humbling as a leader. 
Never um, heard that question. Going you know to who told me that? Beth mm-hmm. Comstock. I interviewed her for the Global Leadership Summit years ago, did a sit-down interview with her. And she was one of the first female chairmen at, at uh, GE. And wow. she said that that was... Uh, one of the questions she would routinely ask her team of herself. And I'm like, wow. It takes I don't know. a lot of humility. I was like, I don't know if I would have the the chutzpah for that, but I have started to implement it. And it's tough, right? But it tells you where, like, I think like having that self-awareness is so key. Reading a room, uh, knowing how you come across to other people is really, really key. How do the answers to that question not become just a gut punch that leaves you reeling for days? Or sometimes does that happen? I think if you have, but if, if, if you have set the tone and you say, I want to know what I want to, to how I want to get better. It's not said out of criticism. It's said out of, because again, you have created an environment where Nobody is perfect. We're all working together. We're all on a journey. We're trying to get better. So yeah, that can be a gut punch, but it's also like, I want to be self-aware. I want to be the best version of myself. And if I think I've ever made it, that oh, once I make it to this point, I'm golden. No, we're always learning. We're always like, you know, changing and and somehow in, in some ways reinventing ourselves and getting stronger as a leader and better as a person. And the only way that happens is through self-reflection, right? Self-reflection through, um, sur- I'm saying trusted people, okay, that you have put trust and they have the, f- the freedom to speak in front of you, right? And I know a lot of leaders that do not do this. And servant mm-hmm. leadership is not, is, is not from their manual, right? They lead by intimidation. Um, what I say is, is, is put into law. People stand when they come into the room. And I just, I'm not a big fan of that. And I think that's why mm-hmm. so many pastors, and I've been part of a lot of churches, including Hillsong, um, I have seen it firsthand where we worship the leaders more than we're actually worshiping our creator. And mm. they haven't surrounded themselves. They haven't created an atmosphere where people had the um, freedom to hold them accountable in a loving way. And it wasn't like, I'm calling you out. It was a loving way to get better. And you saw them ultimately fall from grace because it was just one thing, mistake after the next, because they didn't have anybody who could get in their face and say, look, I love you, brother or sister, but we, we got to reel this in. You know, they just had yes men and yes women surrounding them. So it's a shame that sometimes in church world, we do a worse job of that than they do in the corporate world mm-hmm. or even the world of celebrities or broadcast or movies or that kind of thing, right? Where we all take their ourselves friends are al- sitting on the board. They got all their friends sitting on the board. <laughs> right. that's, yeah, why. that's a really good point. Mm hmm. We've got a series coming up this year on integrity and leadership, and mm. we're going to go there. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. We're going to talk about celebrity culture in the church, um, narcissism in the church. It's it's a real challenge. Yep. I, I, and I, I mean, there are though, as for it, as much as I just called that out, there are some really wonderful leaders that I look up to, Craig Groeschel being one oh. who is just like, he is he likes to say he's obsessed with empowering other people. And I've seen that as a woman, you know, mm-hmm. I have seen that firsthand how he treats other people and he de- he's so quick to deflect, right? And it's not about him. It's about bringing that next generation up. And I think like a true leader uh, looks out for his team more than he looks, that he's looking out for himself, right? And he's leading by example. He's making sure nobody's left behind. He's, uh, as Craig says, obsessed with getting people to the table and making sure they ha- not just have a seat at the table, but they have a voice at the table. That's that's the kind of leader that I really want to be in life, at home, in business with Carrie, the stuff I've got going on with my company. It's hard though, because we all have an ego. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I think that's right. People who say I don't have an ego are probably not being honest with themselves. I echo that about Craig. Yes. They're not very (laughs) self-aware. Right? Good point. So So you've had some big changes in your life. You mentioned Carry Media, your company. It's been three years since you stepped Mm -hmm. away from ABC, GMA, The View, et cetera. So give us the thumbnail version of, because you Mm -hmm. went through a period of like reimagining Totally. And then you landed on the other side. So give yes. us a thumbnail of, of what happened and where you are now. 
Yeah, I think God sometimes, I don't say sometimes, but I think often God allows our pain to turn into our purpose. And I Mm. really believe we're called to different things in different seasons. You know, you've shared with me some things that you feel called to now, but you're like, down the road, I kind of feel like this. I think we have to give ourselves permission to try new things. Sometimes, though, we we are thrust onto that path. And that's really what happened for me. So 2018 pumped the brakes at the height of my broadcasting career when I was anchoring GMA and co-hosting The View and stepped into a much less prestigious position because I was just burned out and you know my my choices were conflicting with with my lifestyle I was just like I just need to spend time with my family I'm, I'm anyway so that happened 2018 and 2020 right at the beginning of the pandemic I lost my job at ABC like so many other mothers and like so many other people and had to figure out what was next and I had this di- divergence where I could stay in TV news which is all I'd ever known and that was the safe space and the safe choice and the expected one Or I could try this other thing. And Carrie, for a very long time, I had been like, I feel like God had lit this, ignited this passion inside of me to really like champion motherhood, um, to, to make sure that motherhood is celebrated instead of scrutinized and punished. And I experienced it as a mother in the workforce. And I started doing, you know, as a journalist, we're supposed to suss out inequities. And I realized that one of the biggest inequities, um, you know, in our country, in America, is the treatment of women, the treatment of what women, once they become mothers, they are paid less. It's something called the motherhood penalty. We're paid less, we're paid 70 cents on the dollar, we're passed over on promotions because we're no longer viable leaders once we become mothers. We're scrutinized for taking time away. Um, And on top of that, the you know, we're, we're burnt out at record levels and we're trying to carry it off. So I really felt like God saying I was supposed to pursue this. I didn't know what it was going to look like. So I, uh, you know, just prayed about the next steps to did the next thing. I didn't know what it, what that was going to do, but just kept taking steps towards it. Founded Carrie from my home in South Carolina, where we moved after I lost my job in, in New York and carry just means we want to help carry the burdens of, of mothers because they're carrying so much working moms are carrying so much. And, um, you know, as a working mom, knowing how I was treated in the workforce, once I became a mother, it was just, I just think it's really, you know, it's, it's inexcusable. It's a marginalized group. So I wanted to be, I wanted to be part of it, a part of changing that narrative and um, changing the game for working moms. Cause the reality is, you know, I grew up with a stay at home mom. That's not the reality for the majority of mothers, the majority of mothers, 70%, at least in, in America, um, will be the primary breadwinner for their family at some point. So if we continue to pay mothers 70 cents on the dollar, you see cycles of debt and poverty continue. And most moms are working now because they have to. We need to give mothers the support they need and deserve. But we also, before that, need to back it up and and value motherhood instead of punishing it and scrutinizing it. Value that we are that we are contributing to the human race, that we are procreating. This is the most beautiful gift that, you know, that we can contribute and, and society benefits from our children too. Uh, And the labor force, we can't grow an economy if we don't have a robust labor force. And that labor force is fueled by our children. (laughs) So anyway, so I started Gary about a year and a half ago. And um, right now it's, it's, you know, trying to figure things out. If I knew an entrepreneur was this difficult, I probably wouldn't have done it. I have had a lot of sleepless <laughs> nights. Even today, I was like, Lord, take this, take this from me, please. <laughs> um, it's, it's so much. Um, it's just so different than anything I've ever done. But I'm what have been try- some I'm of just- the big challenges? I mean, there's a lot I want to mm-hmm. unpack, but when you yeah. talk about entrepreneurship, because in TV, here's your salary, here's your paycheck, here's your jobs. It, it's demanding, you know, you're on call, you do it. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden you start something from nothing and it's like, oh, now it's all on me. Yeah. Like, what I, yeah, was that adjustment like? You're the boss and now it's, um, you know, how are we going to monetize this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because I'm an impact person. I just want to make a big impact. I love to, I'm a big advocator. I love to advocate. And my big advocacy platform is for mothers, right? And at the end of the day for families, right? But um, how we're going to monetize it and keep going, that's what keeps me up at night. Um, Mm -hmm. um, One of my big challenges, and I know I'm a galvanizer. I I know my strengths. I galvanize. I'm tenacious. I get it done. But I kind of squirrel out and try to do too many things at once. Mm -hmm. And that is a big struggle for me. Um, I'm not a business person. And so all of these I could, could, 
could use as an excuse is to stop, right? But I know that when when God calls you to something, He equips you, and often that looks like He's bringing people into your life that are going to help you um, and fill in those blanks. And He has never failed me. It's just like I'm like God, just could you please let me know what's going to happen in the next chapter, please? I'm just you know you get stressed is that out the about hardest it. Part is it certainty like it's clarity, the uncertainty. maybe clarity or certainty? Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. uncertainty, and I love uh-huh. taking risks. I think um, mm. another great quote from Craig Rochelle is, "Failure is the down payment on success." I'm a big risk taker. You know, my my family likes to joke that my mantra is instead of ready aim fire, it's fire aim ready. Like I just go for it, and then I I start driving, and then I adjust the mirrors. I start driving, and then I put the navigation in, and I'm like, oh, I need to turn around. So I'm okay making mistakes, but it's just. Um, you know, I need to have a solid business person on my team because it has taken me out of, and Patrick Lencioni, um, I have the greatest of respect for him in the leadership space. He's identified for me some ver- some working frustrations. And as a leader, like I- I'm not good in this lane and actually it's frustrating me and it's taking me out of the lanes I need to be in. So I need to bring somebody in that can really help with the scalability, helping to monetize this and see things that I don't see because I don't have all the answers. I don't. And a lot of leaders like don't like to admit that. I don't have all the answers, Carrie. I don't. Mm. And um, I need I need people around me to um, help people that I trust, right? To, to help save me from myself, but to help guide me in those directions too, in, in the right direction. So yeah, but I think it's the uncertainty, not the risk, but the uncertainty and not... Sure not knowing what I don't know. And, um, and right now I need, I need that key person on my team to help me. Mm. Well, listeners take note. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you go about the first steps of creating mm-hmm. something out of nothing? Because that is a very pivotal moment. A lot of people have dreams, mm-hmm. very few people execute on those dreams and you're a year and a half into it. So you have this idea it's like, I want to advocate for working moms. Mm-hmm. I want to let people know, as the title of your new book says, you don't have to carry it all. Mm-hmm. So I want them to know that's your message. It's right here. How did my- you figure mm-hmm. out that's the that book. this yep. is the thing? There it is, yeah. for those of you who are watching. You know, they say, um, run towards what scares you. And that's like, yes, I wanted to do this. This is a big passion. Run towards what scares you, that passion in your heart. And I think so many of us um, can overthink it. Um, paralysis by analysis. And we're scared to go for it because our fear of failure, which I had to just kind of normalize failure and normalize fear. Um, The majority of us are scared to do something because we're scared it's going to fail. And when I kind of flipped the script A on failure and fear, that really helped me. You know, people are like, what is the next step? Well, you just, and again, this is, like, I've just had so many people speaking life into me and giving me encouragement. You just do the next right thing. You don't have to write the next 10 chapters. You just do the next right thing. And knowing that failure is the down payment on success and knowing that fear is normal. And if you don't feel a sense of fear about it, it's you're probably not meant to do it. Like you should be scared to go for it. But I say fear and peace coexist together. Learn to reconcile that feeling of peace and passion. I got to go for this. This has got to put it on my heart. I'm really scared. I don't know what, that's normal. It's normal. Do you know, don't be afraid. <laughs> you know, have I not commanded you? Don't be afraid. Don't be, you know, discouraged because, you know, I'm with you everywhere you go. And that's like, that has kind of been my life verse for the last 25 mm. years. But that verse part, have I not commanded you from Joshua 1.9? Have I not commanded you, Carrie? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged for the Lord your God's with you everywhere you go. That has carried me so much. And so just knowing that it's up to me to step in to that fear. And also, you never know that you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction until you actually start moving. It's like your navigation. If you make a wrong turn, it'll tell you. You, but you're never going to know that until you actually start taking steps. So they do the next right thing and do the next right thing and do the next right thing. And oh, maybe that wasn't the right thing, but then do the next and you'll pivot, right? So I just like all that, the, the fear, the failure, it's normal, but it's up to you, okay, to step into that. And everybody's freaked out about it. You're not alone. 
<laughs> and you're gonna That's make true. mistakes. You're gonna make mistakes, but that failure is your down payment on your success. I often say to my team and to leaders, you know, we don't really know what we're doing. We're just mm-hmm. making this up as we go along. Mm-hmm. And that I think is the secret to leadership is none of us are really experts. We're just figuring this out in real time. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. And you know, that's not a weakness to say that. Mm. I think that there's such strength in admitting that you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm the type of leader that wants to learn. Like a lot of the things that I have spewed out today are things I bet that I've learned from other leaders. I didn't come up with it. Right, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the the mirroring. I didn't come up with that, you know. A lot. Of, I I mean, I can't tell you how many things. But a good leader is always on a journey to become the best, better version of themselves, and that's what I want to be. So I was intrigued by some of the stories in your book, the data mm-hmm. in your book. It's mm-hmm. called "You Don't Have to Carry It All." But you talk about some of the inequities and the discrimination that you encountered in journalism Mm -hmm. as a broadcaster. Right. Can you walk through what that field was like for you as a working (laughs) mom? Well, I just, you know, there was this article that came out years ago that it's, and it was from the Atlantic and it said, it's, it's impossible to be a, it's hard to be a woman in TV news, let alone a mother. And you start to read some of the real statistics, not just in TV news though, that again, once you become a mother, you make 70 cents on the dollar compared to fathers for women of color. That's even less. You're all of a sudden, and this kills me, Carrie, that you're all of a sudden, once you become a mother, deemed a less viable leader. You're like, you're like a risk and you're a liability. You're, you're passed over on promotions. You're scrutinized for taking time away to be with your kids. Whereas fathers, and again, this is this book is, you know, you don't have to carry it all, not a case against men. I have a whole chapter, mm. chapter eight, yeah. which invites men into the conversation because we need allies. Um, but conversely, fathers uh, experience the converse effect, which is called the fatherhood bonus. Once they become fathers, they actually make more because they're the provider, they are the parent, and and fathers are more likely to be hired than men without children. So I was just like, we've wow. got to do something about this because they're so, again, like that's marginalization and that's discrimination because of motherhood. Are you kidding yeah. me? And yeah. all the data. So I put on my journalist hat and I interviewed researchers and historians, theologians, sociologists, moms from all walks, got a global perspective on motherhood to figure out not just how we can give mothers, specifically working moms, the support they need and deserve, but why? Because a lot of people don't, they're like, this isn't my problem. Why, why does it matter? But so many of the issues we face in this country, and I think in the world are because we don't value families, we don't value mothers in the workplace. Mm-hmm. So it's it, there's a lot of myth busting in this book. There's a lot of context. You're going to see history, like the history of American family. How, you know, the most traditional American family wasn't the 50s family. It was actually the family that worked side by side, that labored together and produced together and raised the children together. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of context and it's a better way forward for working and momming for for mothers, for for, you know, new moms, um, grandmoms, uh, you know, hopeful moms. And um, I say it's, you know, it's very empowering and hopeful, but lots of Lots of research went into this. So I found your history of the American family, the history of motherhood, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Really? I have a degree in history. Oh, yeah. I have a degree in history and there's stuff I missed along the way. Can you give us Mm. a recap? Because I think most of us go back to our working memories, Mm -hmm. which is sometime between the 70s and the early 2000s for most people listening to this podcast. We (laughs) need to go back a lot further than that. Yeah, yeah. To understand what family has been. Yes, I yeah, I actually realized um so chapter 3 is all about the history of American families and I nerded out on this chapter because mm-hmm. I'm a journalist I like research yeah, yeah. and data to back it up. And I realized I had so many blind spots carry because mm. a lot of the tension that we might feel is it's because of it's generational. Like I grew mm-hmm. up in an environment where the woman was supposed to stay home and, and raise the children and the man was supposed to work and the man's only job was to be a provider. And if he couldn't bring home the bacon, he was a failure. And so much of that is generational. Um, and so when I talked to um, several historians and did a lot of research on the uh, the genesis and the evolution of the American family, so many of us, when we say, what is the traditional American family? We talk about June Cleaver. We talk about the 50s and the 60s where the, yep. the, the man um, works and the woman stays home. Okay. 
what what really struck me about this time, and I think A, we did a disservice to men at this point in time mm. because we pushed men out of the home right. and said that their only obligation was to bring home a paycheck. And if they this couldn't do this, they were a failure. Yeah. Yes. Yep. yep. And, you know, because when the GIs were away, they came home and the women who had been working their jobs had started to find a lot of fulfillment, but then had to give the jobs back to the GIs. Mm -hmm. And women were told in that moment that they were a menace if they wanted to work. And they had one job and that was to stay home with the children. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, all good and dandy, right? But we're pushing men out of the home. We're pushing women out of the workplace. And the reason that we do that this even works a little bit is because it's only working for part of the people, part of the time, black people were forced out of the, out of the workplace and couldn't work. Women were essentially forced out of the workplace and couldn't work. And if mm. they could work, they, if they could, you know, get a job, they were paid much less. It wasn't a more moral time. We've seen the show Mad Men. Uh, yeah. You know, men came home routinely with lipstick on their collars, but what were the mm-hmm. women going to do? They couldn't go get a job. Poverty was at an all-time high. Teen preg- there was a teenage pregnancy boom. And so for me, I realized, oh my God, Gosh, like I had, that's what nostalgia is. It's like, you want the feeling, you want Mm -hmm. to go back to that feeling. And I have nostalgia for for New York and my time at GMA, but I don't want the reality. That's what nostalgia is. And so for Mm. me, realizing that so many of these things that we all have nostalgia over, this traditional family were predicated on awful things. Okay. And then women, but women have to start working again. Um, and they start re-entering the workplace because you need more than one income. And the only reason it works because before it was because so many people were pushed out of the workplace. And again, it wasn't working for everybody. It was only working for part of the people. So, but my aha moment too, was, um, you know, that same point in time, post-World War II, the, the Europe had a totally different reaction to what was happening. They had two crises after the war. They lost all their men. So they, and they, the men were the labor force. So they had two issues. They had to repopulate and they needed, they needed laborers right away. So they turned to women. So they needed women in the workplace, but they also needed those women to procreate and stay in the workplace once they had the babies. So they just, it wasn't like they did it for moral reasons. They just kind of did it out of necessity, but they created policies where mothers could be a mother and a motherhood was celebrated because they needed the babies, right? To mm-hmm, procreate, but mm-hmm. they also needed the mothers in the workplace. So right. that's why they came up with early childhood education that was subsidized and childcare that was subsidized. And there was just this attitude where I am my brother's keeper. We are all invested in these children because they are the future of our country, right? Or here in America, mm-hmm. your kid, your problem. It's on you. Right. We're not a family right. first country. And I'm sorry. Like well, you look at still, you look yes. at American maternity leaves versus the rest of the world. It's right. insanely short. It's, it's insane. The average maternity leave paid globally is 26 weeks and paternity leave is like 17 or 19 weeks globally. And I think yeah. weirdly, we could do more for gender equality by mandating and subsidizing paternity leave than maternity leave. Mm-hmm. Because out of the gate here in America, at least, again, we've pushed men out of the home, out of the gate. It's, the, it's great for the bonding, for father-child bonding. It's great for the father-wife bonding. It's great for the partner. It mitigates postpartum depression. But more importantly, it says we're raising these kids together. It's not all on you and your maternity leave. It's on us. It changes the dynamic. We are in this together to raise these children together. Mm. So. I'd like to go back before the 1950s because mm-hmm. you trace this back in your book a couple of centuries. Do you yeah. want to talk about division of labor? Yeah. And, it, because I think you're right. The the Christian stereotypical ideal mm-hmm. of the family probably is rooted in the 1950s, not well, in the first century. Not that was in all the, of my tension. That was my tension mm-hmm. as a working mother was, this is what a good Christian woman does. She stays home right. with her kids. It doesn't work. That's like a 70 year old vision that has right. no basis in the first century no, or mm-hmm. the 19th century or yep. earlier in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. It was a moment in time that got yeah. lifted up. And I married, you know, I met my wife in law school. She was already a pharmacist when I met her. And so I always had the tension of like being married to a brilliant <laughs> woman who had a career of her own. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's a very different dynamic if you're in a church. I remember yeah. there was one time early on, we got rid of bake sales and bazaars early on, but it was like, well, your wife's going to bring something. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so she decided, okay, I'll play the stereotype. She brought a pie and she walked in 
And, and, you know, the, the reaction of the women were, well, the old pastor's wife used to bring 12 and you could have like, just, it was awful. Oh, anyway, oh my I, gosh. I why did you kill bake sales and bazaars? It may have had something to do with that <laughs> and something to do with biblical tithing, but yeah, they were oh, gone shortly Lord. thereafter. I'm like, this woman is a pharmacist and a lawyer. Like, come on. What are, yeah. what are you even thinking? But yet that's like, even with Harvard Business uh, School graduates, you know, they did a study and, and they they um, interviewed tens of thousands of them. And even with Harvard Business graduates, the expectation was that the man's career would always take precedent over, precedent over okay, the woman. Yeah, you raised yeah. that. That's interesting. So how did mm-hmm. you and your husband deal with that? Well, my, and we could talk about the division of labor. We could talk about the division of labor, like throughout history, women were never equal in society, but they were always respected in the field. Even the Proverbs 31 woman who we have reduced her to a domesticated housewife. She was a masterful negotiator. She was a manager. She was a farmer. She was in the marketplace every day. She bought a field with her earnings and planted it. The, their society, like the stability of the society was, was on her and their men were at war. So they had to be able to, yeah. to take care of every single thing. If the man went off to war, women were the original brew, you know, brewers for, for beer. They always yeah. worked side by side, but it wasn't until the fifties where you're like, you know, or if you had an elite society, the Victorian society where you could pay somebody to do all of this work. So mm-hmm. anyway, you could see like, um, but you just mentioned my home, uh, our my story of spousal equity is totally the exception, especially in the Christian spaces, you know, where I felt a lot of tension because a good woman, godly woman stays home, and raises the kids. And, but I'm like, but God gave me this, uh, these, these passions, you know, these callings. Uh, motherhood is my priority. Absolutely. Um, but God's put other things on my heart too. And I want to invite my kids into the process of that, right? Of shining my light for God. Um, but my husband was a college basketball coach when my career started taking off and he made the decision. We made the decision together. I didn't force him. He's like, we're going to pursue this for you, Paula, because I know there's a double standard my face, I can get back into coaching when I'm 70 and I'm a dirty dog. He's like, mm. your face looks like it does for a season, you know, because that's just mm. the double standard in our society. So yeah. he moved, we moved from Cincinnati to Chicago and he got into, he left basketball and got into real estate. We moved from Chicago to New York and he left residential real estate and got into commercial real estate. Mm. And I will say that is definitely the exception he is a very confident man, but he always felt like we were we we were partners in it, and it and that could be hard for a lot of men because we they are men are subject to the patriarchy where we have told them your only job is to bring home a paycheck, right? right. And it all gets back to these toxic messages that men have been hearing too, which are often generational. So what's really cool about this story is once we moved down to South Carolina. John got tapped to coach again. And so, yes, he's doing commercial real estate from our home. He's working from home, but he's also coaching at a high school and he's coaching at a sports academy. So God brought it all back, which is so cool, I Mm. think. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And were there more complex dynamics to that when you sort of had the, okay, I'm going to be the primary breadwinner moment Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. I'm going to have the dominant career. I'm going to determine, like, we'll move cities based on my career, not your career. Were there other dynamics you had to navigate in the midst of that with John? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, and there were other dynamics, like specifically from my mother, who was like, Paula, you need to be home with your children. And I'm like, I am home, but like, I have a babysitter, you know, I like, are you saying? And so that was so much of the tension that I felt um, was what the church had told me. And I think often the scriptures are, you know, weaponized against women, against the roles of women, mm-hmm. against where we stand in society and home and work. And um, I write about it in chapter five. Um, and because of, there's a lot of cultures and traditions and religions that have diminished the roles of women in society and mm. home and work. And so I, ha- I found a lot of freedom interviewing the president of Proverbs th- or the, uh, a theologian from Proverbs 31, Joel Matamala. Oh, yeah. He's, he's their director he's of great. theology, Lisa Turkhurst, because, um, uh, yeah, I definitely think, and this is, this was hard for me, but often Christianity is misogyny in disguise. That was the experience that I found, um, you know, it, so often growing up and even through college where the roles of women were really diminished, um, you know, get in the kitchen where you belong, right? That sort of, that sort of mentality. Yep. And we joke, we would joke about it too, but um, it's, been, it was, it was really distorted. But a lot of the tension that I felt and that John felt was because we both came 
we came from very similar homes where the man worked, the woman stayed home. You know, it was very traditional, but again, it's very generational. It's very generational because yeah. even dating back, you know, 100 years before, it wasn't like that. The men, they were, you guys were working in the fields together. You were working side by side and laboring together and producing together, raising the children together. That bifurcation came in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, a farm was a joint venture mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. You know, and if you watched a minute of Yellowstone or 1830, well, not Yellowstone, but 18, what is it, 1883? Yeah, 1883. You know, it's a joint and 19, venture. Right. Yeah. And, and again, the women didn't have the same amount of rights per, by any stretch of the imagination, no. but they were respected in the field. They had to take over those farms if their husbands, like they, they had to know enough and be active enough to take over the farm, to take over whatever it was in case their husband died or he went to war and never came home. And just to answer the comments that are piling up in YouTube right now, um, we're, are you suggesting that Christianity is misogynist in nature or no, that no, our no. application is misogynist? I think often Christianity is what the scriptures can be weaponized against women. There I do go. not think Christianity is mis. I think often it looks like misogyny in disguise in certain denominations. But if you Correct. look at Jesus, yeah. the way that Jesus elevated the role of women, that it was women who found him, you know, outside of the tomb, Jesus made a point to elevate women at a time when they were third rate citizens. And I think we have to go back to what does Jesus say about the role of women? He allowed Mary to sit at his feet, which was something that he would only allow teachers and, and uh, st or students that wanted to become a rabbi. He allowed them to sit at his feet. There's so many examples of women who, um, who Jesus elevated or who were elevated in the Bible. And that's why I think the Bible and God and Jesus, what, what they have said about women has been turned a little bit. And I felt this, like I, I'm a Christian, but I was, you know, I grew up Catholic and then we went to the Lutheran church and then I went to a Baptist high school and then a Bible college. We went to a Pentecostal church. So like <laughs> I've seen a lot of it. I don't get caught up in a lot of the nuances, but I know what Jesus says about women. And that's what's most important to me. Yeah, I figured that's what you were saying. I just wanted to clarify that. No, and, if you uh, read chapter five, read mm -hmm. chapter five though, because I found yeah. a lot of freedom. And I'm just saying that certain Christians have misinterpreted the Bible to sure. we and weaponized it against women and our roles in society. Get in the kitchen and cook and clean where you belong. And that's not biblical, actually. What is mom guilt? in your experience. <laughs> well, mom guilt is definitely something. So the book is, it is, you don't have to carry it all, ditch the mom guilt and find a better way forward. Mom mm. guilt is very much an American thing. And we put so much pressure on ourselves to be a perfect mother, to be this perfect Pinterest mother that we have to carry it all. Mm. We have to do it all. And when we don't, we're failing. Uh, or if we ask for help, we're weak or we're a failure. But we carry so much guilt um, for a myriad of reasons here in America, you look globally at mothers, they don't have a choice but to work, Carrie, and they take a lot mm -hmm. of pride in working. But the attitudes like they are in, in most other countries are we are all invested in these children. It's not your kid, your problem he, like it is here in America. Right. It's communal. And, and communal. There's policies that support parents and families and other communities. But here the guilt is, oh, I'm working. I'm not I'm not with my children. It's so much of it is because we don't have a realistic measuring stick of what it means to be a woman or a, a, a mother or a working mother here in America. We don't. Right. We have June Cleaver and she set us up for disaster because she <laughs> made us feel like we, I mean, we had to do it all and carry it all. And ironically, some of the data that I found is that today's mo working mom and single moms are spending more time with their kids than the moms in the 1960s. And yet we think that like we're failing and we have to be this perfect mom. And we just don't, we have to put down the expectations and say, I need help. I can't carry it all anymore. And our kids, when we work, the data shows like sons of working mothers tend to be really great partners and good fathers. And they're very involved. Like we're not harming our children um, right. by working, but, but we need to invite them into the process too, which I've started to do. Paula, you've been through burnout and <laughs> uh, you write about it as well. Do you want to talk about mom burnout? Yeah. Uh, I had a really mm -hmm. interesting conversation a few years ago with Annie F. Downs. We'll link to that episode mm -hmm. in the podcast show. Annie's notes, great. Annie's awesome. And she was kind of like, men get to take sabbaticals for their burnout. I'm paraphrasing here from memory. <laughs> and, you know, men get an official diagnosis. And for a lot of women, it's just called life. 
and you don't <laughs> so get a break. True. You don't get a sabbatical. Mm-hmm. I'd love your take on burnout because yeah. I'm very concerned about it. I think it is an epidemic for women and for men mm-hmm. and for working people, but also for college students and yeah. like, people are burning out on life. How, what, what are your thoughts and advice yeah. for uh, burnout, I particularly think we, for moms? We have to broaden the scope of what we think of burnout because when we think burnout, we're like, I'm just burnt. I, you can only burn out on a job. I mm. learned through a very good friend of mine, Joe Saxton, who is another yeah. wonderful uh, faculty member of the Global Leadership Summit. She said, because I reached a point about a year and a half ago, and she's, or I just was a, I was a shell of myself. I was very um, agitated and exacting with everyone. I wasn't burnt out on the work that I'm doing for Carrie. Right. I was a burnout on that. Um, I was a burnout on being a wife. Uh, I was a burnout on, on, on anything, but I, what I was burnout out was my own expectations and I was burnout out on being a mother. And I think when we broaden the scope of what can cause burnout, Joe helped me identify that I was really burnout out on motherhood because I was burnout out on my own expectations of what I expected from my children and what I expected wow. from myself. And so broadening that conversation um, and what does burnout look like? She's like, burnout is when you are, um, you know, again, just you're you're not in a healthy space. You're, you're not who you feel that you normally are when your family members are saying, like my family members, my kids are like, mom, you're not acting like yourself. You're very exacting. Like, I just, like, I wanted to punch a wall. I was so, mm. I was angry. Um, and I was burnt on my expectations. I had such high expectations of my mm. children and so, of, of what they should be doing and what they should um, contributing. And that was adding to my burnout. And then uh, another friend of mine who's an entrepreneur, she said that when she feels herself reaching those like DEFCON levels of burnout, what she tries to do is, um, of course, you have to say no to things. You know, we talk about ruthlessly saying no to things that, that aren't your priority. She said, I realized I had to start weaving in things that brought me joy because mm-hmm. often when you're saying no to things ruthlessly you're also saying no to the things that that bring you joy so making wow. making yourself a priority and this isn't like self-care or a spa okay but it's also realizing i have to say i have to weave something and maybe i am saying yes to something that brings me joy it might be a, a a car ride in the countryside for two hours and I'm just going to stop at random little country markets along the way. Nobody, I'm not going to pick up a phone call. Do something that just gives you joy and say yes, Mm -hmm. say yes to something that gives you joy because we can ruthlessly say no to everything. And when we're ruthlessly saying no to everything, we're also saying no to the things that, that bring us joy. Um, but yeah, burnout's at an all-time high, especially for American mothers. Mm-hmm. And then add Tad on top of that, all the marginalization that we're paid less and scrutinized and penalized. And it's like, it's more, it's harder to be an American mother uh, now than ever before. And that's why I really just want to beat the drum for moms because I think there's nothing that moms can't do, but that doesn't mean that we should carry it all. One of the things I've seen, you talk about imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. I know so many high achieving women, smart intelligent who feel like they're not enough Mm -hmm. they're imposters they just struggle with that Mm -hmm. and they can never seem to find satisfaction Mm. have you seen that and if so any tips for somebody imposter syndrome is it 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 affects highly successful people (laughs) i mean almost always highly successful people and you feel like you're a fraud oh my gosh if somebody just catches on to me and they find out that i'm a that I actually don't know everything. Um, and it gets back to our fear of failure, which is the most common yeah. fear that we have. We're all scared to be vulnerable, to say, I'd like you mentioned early, Carrie, uh, you know, as a leader to say, we're just kind of figuring out as we go. There's not enough people that are oh, doing that. There, there's mm. not enough people that are doing that, that are saying, yeah. I'm just figuring it out as I go because you have to put on this persona. I would just say like imposter syndrome, it affects the most successful people, the most successful people. So if you're feeling that you're already there, but you're also not alone and um, you're never going to have it all figured out. If you wait to have it all figured out, you'll be dead. (laughs) And even then, right? So, (laughs) um, but yeah, it's very common and you're not alone. Well, so we're figuring all of this out together. This has been a rich conversation. Anything you want to say, uh, 
that we haven't covered? I feel like, I mean, you've done a really good job. It's been a really wide ranging um, interview. I'm glad you let me clarify those remarks about Christianity. Jesus is the love of my life. And um, absolutely. And I knew you meant that. And that's mm -hmm. why I just wanted to make sure, hey, yeah. This is where you're coming from. I and appreciate that. And that's a, as a, as an interviewer, that's a really good skill. Hmm. Just say, Hey, I know that, but that you're also helping save me from some territory where I maybe misinterpreted, or maybe I said something because it's a lot, you know, this is live. And often you say things and you're like, I didn't, that didn't come out right. Right. But no, you don't it realize came out that right in the end. Yeah, right. And so, we have listeners who listen to the end and we have listeners who understand context and nuance, but, <laughs> and then, there's the don't that's it but well, there's a couple yes, of people uh -huh. the algorithm steers our way uh -huh. who maybe would have enjoyed that sure. but you know at back to where we started as an interviewer i want you to come back on oh thank you, you i know? really like, appreciate I don't, that i don't want you to be like oh i did that interview with carrie and then i got a hundred emails and dms about the bible and oh. i want to quit like, no. I, you know, you want, and, and I, I knew that's where you were coming from. Yeah. I knew that was your heart. Exactly. No, but it's been a really yeah. wide ranging interview. I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed just the depth and breadth of the conversation. We talked about a lot of things and if people have questions for me, I'm, um, accessible on my Instagram account, Paula Ferris. So, but I'd love for you to pick this. If you have a, yeah. a mother, any mother in your life that you want to feel seen and heard and valued and validated. Um, you don't have to carry it all. It's available everywhere. It's cheapest, I think, at Walmart right now for yeah. 16 bucks. So we got Mother's Day coming up. Um, do you guys have, okay, we so in, in Canada, do you guys have? We do. Mother's we have Day? it, I think, around the same time as the US in May. Okay. And okay. then I know Australia does it very differently, though. There's a different, like it's in the fall or something, yes. Mother's Day and Father's Day. Okay. Right. But yeah, hey, if you have, uh, you know, maybe a spouse or maybe a best friend or a mm -hmm. sister or, whatever co-worker yeah it's a great gift and for leaders and for leaders you have a lot of leaders um so you know i've kind of explained like you know there's a lot of research and analysis and myth busting yeah, and stories book, it's guys. not a devotional book y'all like three is the history of american families five is i really dive mm -hmm. into um you know what does the bible say about women in our roles um chapter Eight is about inviting men into the conversation. But chapter nine, for all the leaders out there, like supporting families, supporting mothers in the workplace is not just the right thing to do, but it's actually great for your company's bottom line. You won't find a more loyal, productive, efficient uh, employee than a mother, but she has to be well supported. And so um, chapter nine, I talk to a lot of different um businesses big and small about ways that they've gotten creative to support mothers and families um, in the workforce but uh, it's there's a lot of ideas in there for you if you're like and I it's... need to I need to attract the top talent that won't leave you know because it's it's hard to do business these days and get people to work for you that don't want to leave look for a mother there's no greater employee from my perspective and what motherhood has equipped you with empathy, efficiency, courage, vision, leadership, emotional IQ, social cues, equipped through motherhood, find a mother, hire a mother, support her as a mother. And she won't leave. And I outline ways to do that. Paula, this is great. The book is available widely and you um, your, your website. You can go to my website, paulaferrisofficial.com, but just check, check it out. And um, you can reach out to me on Instagram if you want to connect. Awesome. We can keep the conversation going. Paula, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation, Carrie. God bless. Okay. You too.